Hey everybody, Todd here. Today we're going to be talking about my top five EF Tour recruiting tips. It's probably going to be pretty short, but I think this is going to be the most important video that I've ever done. A lot of this stuff is going to be common sense. Most of this is going to be obvious to you guys, but just in case, I'm going to break this down into simple, cold, hard truths. So here we go. My top five recruiting tips for your EF Tour. Number one. The students have to like you. Number two, you need to choose amazing chaperones to go with you. Number three, make sure you choose amazing kids to go with you. Number four, the parents have to trust you. Number five, be genuine, be authentic. You have to be yourself. That's it. It's really that simple. I've laid out some broad strokes. Let's take an in-depth look at each one of these things and go into a little bit of detail. So number one, the students have to like you. I don't care if you're going to the most amazing places on the planet. We're taking kids to the Eiffel Tower. We're going to the mountains of Peru. We're going to Machu Picchu. We're going to see the Berlin Wall. If the kids don't like you, it's going to be difficult to recruit for your tour. No one wants to go with a person that they don't like. It's a simple fact. I love music, but I don't want to see my favorite band next to my friend who never shuts up. So let's talk about this. Do you talk to your students like they're people? Are you the sort of teacher that only talks to the kids in the hallway when they've done something wrong? Are you the guy that's high-fiving people in the hallways? Are you shaking hands with everybody? Are you checking in with kids just to see how their day's going in the cafeteria? If that's you, you're probably going to do a great job as an EF tour leader. I think it's important to make sure that as many students in the school know you as a friendly, trusted adult who's genuinely interested in them. Students like teachers that are invested in them, especially the teachers that don't have to be. So, do you go to soccer games? Do you help out chaperoning on dances? Do you talk to the kids in the cafeteria? Do you sponsor a club? Are you that sort of teacher? Once you've established yourself as an integral part of the school, then you say, oh, I want to take kids on one of these EF tours. They're going to come knocking on your door. Kids are going to know who you are and they're going to want to come, A, because of the location and B, because it's you. So let's talk about number two, choosing amazing chaperones. I'm going to explain my thought process to you. I usually get large tours between 50 and 90 students on most of them. So that means I can get a wide variety of chaperones. The first thing that I do is make sure that we have a male and a female chaperone on every tour that we go. So we got me. I'm a middle-aged, balding, slightly overweight guy. So who am I going to look for? I'm probably going to look for a younger female teacher to counterbalance me. Next. I consider where we're going, and I try to get a teacher that specializes in the language of that country. At my school, we have Spanish, French, and German classes, so it's relatively easy for me to get a Spanish-speaking person, a French-speaking person, or a German-speaking person to go with us when we visit those countries. A good balance of ages, genders, ethnicities is nice, but that's not really the most important thing. The most important thing when selecting chaperones is to pick people that are always dependable. Who do the kids like? Who never misses a day at school? Who always turns in their grades on time and doesn't need help getting their work done? Those are the teachers that I want to come with me to help. I want people that can think for themselves and take charge of a situation. If you don't come to work on time every day, I'm never going to ask you to help me on a tour. If the kids are always asking to get out of your class, probably not going to ask you to be a chaperone on one of my tours. It doesn't matter how much I like people personally, when you're on a tour, you need to have people that are likable, that are responsible, that are always doing what they need to do. After that, there's a few other things that I look for. If there's a teacher that's teaching a class that fits well with the tour that we're going to go on, I'm going to ask that teacher to come with us. For example, when we went to Germany, I brought two of our world history teachers with us. When we go to Spain or we went to Costa Rica, it made perfect sense to ask one of the Spanish teachers to come with us. Uh, along that line, when we went to Costa Rica, 
I asked a couple science teachers to come with us because we're talking about biomes, we're talking about ecotourism, we're talking about the environment. It fit in well with their curriculum. My goal is to bring every teacher that wants to come on one of these tours with me at least once. Um, if a German teacher can say, here's part of the Berlin Wall and show them a picture of themselves with other students, that lesson is going to be a little bit more memorable for those kids than it otherwise might have been. This helps create a culture that's less about the classroom and more about experiences and hands-on types of things. After that, I try to get at least one teacher that is ridiculously organized. Who's the one that's got the clipboard in their hand all the time? They've got a checklist. They know what happens at 1032. They know what happens at 1033. I try to get a teacher that's whimsical and fun. Just the kids love to be around that person. I also look for a teacher who's really intellectual. When we're going on our tour, that teacher who's a little bit more intellectual might be able to tell some stories while we're on the bus or point out some interesting facts about any place that we might be. You also need what I call a kid whisperer. You have to have somebody on your tour who knows how to talk to the kids that you're going to be with in case something goes wrong. Kids get homesick. They fall in love and then they fall out of love on every single tour. They get crushes on each other. Or they get really nervous because they're going flying for the very first time or they're doing whatever it happens to be for the first time and they get overwhelmed emotionally. You need to bring somebody with you that can calmly talk with them and is not going to lose their patience and is going to be able to get them through it if things go wrong. If I've got a teacher in my building that maybe backpacked through Europe or Central America after college or in a summer in college, that person's going to be invaluable on one of our tours. So I'm going to tap them to try to help me out as a chaperone once in a while. Can you get a teacher who can organize a group activity on the fly? That's a really good person to have with you. You get flight delays once in a while, or there's a longer line than you'd expect, or in climate weather happens, or you have to wait more than you thought you could, are you just going to sit there? Or do you have a teacher who can instantly get the kids all to sing the same song, or start asking them questions that starts a group discussion, or play a game with them on the spot? Those people are really good chaperones to have with you. If you're going to take kids on a tour like this, don't you want it to be the most amazing experience that they have ever had? The easiest way to do that is to get great chaperones to come with you. Number three, you have to choose great kids. When it comes time for recruitment, I get a couple hundred packets and invitations from EF tours. And I give them out gradually over the course of the week. On a Monday, for example, when I'm starting my recruitment process, I'll probably only give out 15 or 20 invitations. And I work in a school with 1,500 kids. I'm going to give that first 15 invitations to the kids that are just awesome. They're not necessarily the smartest. They're not necessarily the athletic studs or anything like that. They're the kids that smile at everybody they see. Those are the kids that if somebody drops their notebook, they're the first to help them pick it up. So it takes a little doing to figure out who those kids are. So I'll ask some teachers, who are the best kids in your classroom? Who are the most helpful? Who are the ones that are really trustworthy? Who are the ones that are polite and respectful and smile and like to have a good time? So I'm going to send it out to those kids first. Then I start to consider where we're going. Are there classes that lend themselves more than others to the trip that we're going to go on? The easy example, if we're going to Paris, I'm going to make sure that I send an invitation on day two and day three to every single kid that's taking French in my school. After that, then I might hand it out to the gifted kids. I might hand it out to the avid kids. I might hand it out to every kid who's in core math six. Where we're going to go is going to dictate which kids I'm going to invite. Now, I have to say, and in, in my school, for my tours, I'll let anybody come. It's not that if you don't get an invitation, you aren't welcome to come. I put posters up in my office and on a little bulletin board outside my door so that if anybody wants to come, they can. 
but I'm going to try to tailor my invitations to kids that I think want to go or might be interested based on the courses that they've selected. And again, I try to get a solid core of really nice kids who are helpful, who are polite, who are respectful, who just like to have a good time wherever they go. Let's talk about number four. The parents have to trust you. This is another crucial part of recruitment. Parents are going to send their children across the Atlantic Ocean or over to Japan or God knows where with somebody. They need to make sure that they can trust the person who's taking them. You need to communicate with the parents regularly. You need to tell them what's going to happen. And then you need to actually make sure that you follow up on what you said you were going to do. I send out monthly emails to parents at least 12 months before we leave. Now, just a quick pause. I usually start my recruitment process two years before we go. So we give people more time to pay for the tours and all that sort of thing. Um, I figure if you've got 10 months to pay for a tour that could cost you three or $4,000, that's going to limit the number of kids that are going to come. If you've got two years to come up with three or $4,000, it's a little easier to make the payments on that. So, so what do I do for those two years? For the first year, I probably send out an email every three months or so, and I'll have a meeting every six months. If we're going to go in July, then starting in August, they're going to get a monthly update from me at least. And I'm going to tell them, this is what's going on. This is what I need you to do in the next couple months. Here are the short-term things to think about. Here are the long-term things to think about. And here are the immediate things that I need you to do. And I send that out over and over and over again as we get closer and closer and closer to our trip. I also hold at least three face-to-face -face meetings during the school year before we leave. And for me, we always leave in the summertime. If it's possible, I want our last meeting to be sort of like a picnic. I'll find a place where we can cook hot dogs and hamburgers, maybe play a game of kickball or dodgeball or something like that. For a couple reasons. A, I want the parents to see, I want the kids to enjoy themselves. B, I want the kids to enjoy themselves. C, I want some kids who may not know each other to at least get a chance to meet some other kids on the tour before we actually go. That way, the parents get to see the chaperones interacting with the kids and they're going to have an idea of what's actually going to happen on tour. And that usually allows them to set aside their fears because they realize who you are and who's with you and how you're actually going to interact with the kids. So, that leads me to rule number five. You have to be genuine. There's one thing teenagers and parents can figure out really quick, and that is how to know if you're being phony. I am a completely hyperactive ADD guy who gets really, really excited about things and wants everybody else to get just as excited as I am. So that's the person that I have to be. If you're calm and organized, you've got to be the calm, methodical, organized person that you are. If I try to act a way that's not me, A, it's not going to work because I'm faking it. B, everybody's going to realize that something's not really right. So my best advice to you on this particular issue is be who you are. If you're unorganized, be unorganized, but be the cheerleader. Make sure you've got somebody who's organized with you who can help you with the parts that need to be organized. Don't try to be something that you're not. We're all works in progress, so keep working hard to be the best version of you that you can be. That's it. Number one, the students have to like you. Number two, you need to choose amazing chaperones to go with you. Number three, choose great kids. Make sure you've got a good solid group to come with you. Number four, the parents have to trust you. And number five, be authentic, be genuine, be yourself. This is the way that I do it. These are the things that I think are important. Now I know that other people have a different value system and you might have different priorities for me or better ideas than I do probably. So let's share ideas with everybody so that we can make our trips as good as possible for all of us. Thanks. Bye.